Good afternoon, all. Afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar under the title Ergonomics, Environment, Health, and Safety. Brought to you by the UEMONA Library Health and Wellness Committee, LUCO. I'm pleased to have you here and excited to hear and learn from this webinar. I am Nicole Johnston, co-lead of LUCO and your moderator for this webinar. I will be assisted by Mrs. Latoya Johnson Phillips, who will pray, and we'll have other LUCO members, Mrs. Ruth Rooms Ufar and Mr. Miguel McCoy, who will be monitoring the chat for me today. In today's web webinar, we will be hearing from our campus librarian, Dr. Paul Carr, to bring greetings to our audience. Our first speaker, senior physiotherapist and consulting ergonomic practitioner, ergonomics practitioner, lead personnel in the outpatient um, physiotherapy clinic at the West Indies, at the University Hospital, Hospital of the West Indies, Mr. Nicholas Henry, presenting under the title, Psychosocial Work Factors, the Invisible Risk. After which we'll have our second speaker, who will occupational safety and health officer, for Mona and the Western Jamaica campus, Mr. Ryan Ratchery, and he'll be presenting under the title, Creating an Ergonomic Work Environment. Before we begin, I want to review a few housekeeping issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared via the Mona Library's YouTube channel. We will be hearing from both presenters first, then a question and answer session will follow of such. We invite persons to write down their questions or comments for that session. As a part of today's webinar, we will get you out of here within one and a half hour. So please allow me to invite Mrs. Johnson Phillips to pray. Then we will hear from our campus librarian who will bring us her greetings and introduction for our speakers. But just before Mrs. Johnson Phillips comes on, please allow me to thank our very own Miss Simone Harrison. She was the person who brought this, this the need for this webinar, the, the ergonomics, the topic ergonomics to my attention and I ran with it. And Dr. Sonia Williams, she's a lecturer at the physiotherapy department. She was the person that put us through to our first speaker and presenter, Mr. Nicholas Henry. And for that, we want to give them a real hearty thank you. Also, just a little additional thing. You can visit the library's website and find resources on ergonomics via UWI link. We have ergonomics um, resources done by the Science Branch Library. So you can always try to use UWI link. I'll put a link of UWI link in the chat. So anybody wants to find resource can find it. So let us ask Miss, Mrs. Johnson Phillips, Latoya Johnson Phillips to pray for us now, please. Most righteous and last simple. We just want to thank you, mighty God, for this opportunity, mighty God, to come together in this fashion, mighty God, for this webinar, Daddy Jesus. You saw that there was a need, mighty God, and even though we are not able to be in a face-to-face -face setting, mighty God, you allow us, mighty God, to be able to utilize, mighty God, the online platform. I pray, God, that as the session go for it, mighty God, we will learn and mighty God be able to to apply mighty God and also mighty God bring it to others attention mighty God that they too can learn something mighty God I pray that uh, you will let, let everything go for it mighty God according to your will mighty God let uh, the internet work efficiently mighty God let everything go smoothly mighty God I pray that uh, whatever questions that we have to ask mighty God we will be able to ask them without fear mighty God and the presenters will be able to answer them mighty God in a way that we can understand daddy Jesus uh, pray that you will just take full control right now in your name Jesus amen amen thanks very much Mrs. Johnson Phillips all right next item on our Agenda is the opening remarks and speaker's bio from Dr. Paulette Carr. 
over to you, Dr. Carr. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnston. Um, and my thanks to the health and wellness team for always coming to the fore with these very, very interesting um, webinars. Um, you know, I spoke to Mr. Heron on the weekend, and one of the things that I said to him was the, the, the level of expertise that we bring to these, um, these webinars, we should, rear, we should share them across the Mona messaging platform. We should, we should open it up, not just for our library staff, um, but we should really, because we've had some excellent, excellent webinars um, brought to us by, by our health and wellness team. And whilst I understand that um, the COVID pandemic sort of pushed us, pushed the agenda forward because I, I saw where that was happening more frequently. I think the topics that have been addressed are, are really so relevant to persons outside of the libraries that I, I think we should really, for the next time around, ensure that it is promoted across, um, across the library. But I, I, I bring greetings um, to all of the participants this afternoon. I'm particularly pleased um, with our presenters and I really want to say thanks to them. Thanks for HR, um, for two, for pushing. I see Ms. Thompson. Well, I heard her voice a little earlier. Not sure if she's still on the call. Um, um, just to say thanks to, to everybody. Um, and Ms. Johnston mentioned um, Ms. Williams, um, who helped in getting one of the speakers, and our own Simone Harrison, who initiated them. You know, the varied aspects of health and wellness for us is very important in the library, especially that the strategic initiative of the university, the strategic plan of the university still maintains for the next strategic plan. If you look at it, the, the idea of having that um, camp environment, that the, the staff that is going to be rounded and, and perform at a level, it is still on the agenda. Um, developing that rounded um, professional team, it is still part of the agenda for the entire university. And certainly in the library, we place um, the well-being of our staff at a very, very, very important, um, it's, it's on, the, on the agenda for our strategic plan, the last, strategic plan, we had staff development as an area of focus. Part of it was, was because the, the last accreditation team highlighted that as an area that we needed to focus on. But even before that, we were focusing on staff development in all areas, not just looking at training of our staff, and so we find that this health and wellness team has really been, has really taken up the mantra of looking at the wellness, the health and wellness of staff. And, and therefore, I'm really, really appreciative of the team um, for their, their work. Um, they, they are doing exercise classes. They are doing food and health and wellness so that we have um, farmers, uh, not a farmer's market, but like a, a fruits day. Um, recently, they were part of um, a conference that was, that was held at the medical library. So our team is working very hard because we see the, the our staff development and the health and wellness of our staff as so very important. So I really want to, to bring greetings to everybody on the platform and just to say thanks to you all for participating. And of course, this whole idea of ergonomics, you know, one of the first things when I came in here as campus librarian was that quite a few of the staff members, they were asking for um, 
chairs and furniture that were that would help them to perform better and we pushed for that with the the bursa sometimes the bursa doesn't like us to talk about um getting furniture for staff but we say to her you know it's everything that counts it is it is all that fitting the job and the task to the, the, the capacity and capabilities of the worker. So you have to undergird them with the relevant. Um, um, it's, so it's not, it's not and, I, and I'm not saying by any means, it's just about chairs and about desks, but it's the entire environment that we are looking at. And one of the things when I looked up about this whole idea of ergonomics, it said that if we apply all of the things that we learn about ergonomics, it is going to make a difference in the productivity and the output of our staff. And so for us, that is very important. We are always looking at how we can improve the output of our staff. I mean, I have to say, and I say it publicly and I say it privately that I have one of the best teams on the campus. The library team performs well. I mean, I push them and I quarrel with them and and all sorts of things, but I also encourage them because they work very hard. So if we can find ways of improving, um, improving the great output that we have, we want to work with HR, we want to work with the teams um, in physiotherapy, we want to make sure that our teams in the library are always going way above and beyond. So I'm grateful for this, this, this webinar, and I really want to thank our speakers. So without further ado, let me just introduce both speakers. Uh, Mr. Nicholas Henry, as Ms. Johnston said, is a senior physiotherapist and consulting ergonomics practitioner who is currently the team lead in the outpatient physiotherapy clinic at the University Hospital of the West Indies. Mr. Henry completed his physiotherapy training in Jamaica in 1997 and went on to complete the Certified Ergonomics Assessment Specialist Training from the school, the, I, I, I'm not sure, um, there's a school in Atlanta in 2005. In 2011, he completed his master's degree in health ergonomics um, in the UK and is a graduate member of the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors in the UK. Now, we didn't even know that there is such a, an institute. So these, these webinars are really good for, for us in the library. And Ms. Ms. Johnston, thank you so much for pushing the, the resources that we have in the library so that people can go to your link. Make sure to put the, the link um, in the chat. Since, since um, graduating, he has presented widely at various interdisciplinary fora on the subject and has served as adjunct lecturer in, in ergonomics in the occupational health, sorry, occupational and environmental safety and health undergrad and master's programs. And here it says he currently divides his time between his clinical practice and consultancy in ergonomics. And our second speaker is Mr. Ryan Rattray, who is an occupational safety and health officer with over six years of experience in the occupational safety and health. Four years with the UWI Mona, where he is the lead person responsible for daily operations for occupational safety and health for the Mona campus and, the, and WJC. To date, his greatest accomplishment has been implementing a safety risk and data management system for the campus. Kudos to you, Mr. Ratchet. His favorite quote is, the greatest mistake you can make is to be continually fearing that you'll make one, oh dear. And this is from Albert Hubbard. So without um, further ado, I will call on our first speaker, Mr. Nicholas Henry, um, to speak on the topic of, I think it's psychosocial risk, Mr. Henry. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let me just get prepared to share my screen from the beginning. 
All right, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, as if my voice is failing me. This is my third speaking in for the day. Um, so hopefully I can get content out to you before my voice um, fails me. Today we're talking about something that's really dear to my heart in terms of psychosocial work factors. Um, I label it the invisible risk because psychosocial work factors contribute so significantly to your health and safety at work but they are often left out of most of the conversation about occupational health um, and safety. And certainly within the context of ergonomics, the expectation is largely driven about the physical tools and technologies that we interface with. So uh, hopefully, I mean, this is something that is normally delivered over several lectures um, over a, a lengthy time period. So I'm really gonna have to step on it to be able to deliver the content in 15 to 20 minutes. So hopefully I'm up for the task. All right, so in going through it, I'm going to introduce what psychosocial work factors are for those who may be unfamiliar, um, but I'm going to use case studies to actually create the context so you can have a better appreciation for what exactly we're talking about and the impact. But the conversation starts first and foremost with the whole understanding that wherever you are in the continuum of health, it is going to be driven both biologically and psychologically, as well as by social determinants. So whether you are well, <clears throat> because you are at good physical and mental well-being, or you're living with aches and pains in the shoulder, having carpal tunnel syndrome, et cetera, the development of your state of health is going to be driven by factors other than your biology. And it's an absolutely critical understanding that a lot of people fail to grasp in terms of when you're having pains. For example, a lot of the patients that we meet with uh, rotator cuff pathologies or carpal tunnel, let's stick with that one, um, expect that because this is a pathology that affects the wrist, that the mediating factors there are confined to the things you do with your wrist um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and hopefully by the time I'm finished, you'll have a, a slightly better understanding of what we're talking about in terms of securing your health. So the conversation also, let me back that up. The conversation also about psychosocial factors is very timely. Um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act of 2017 will replace the Factories Act of 1945 as the prevailing literature or the legal framework for um, references on occupational health and safety in Jamaica. And one of the differences between the two pieces of legislation is that psychosocial hazards are named explicitly in the current act. Well, it's not been passed yet, but it will be short. Um, but when it becomes passed, psychosocial hazards are going to be part of what employers are going to be held accountable for in terms of identifying and managing in a work environment. Whereas before it was a little bit of an afterthought and insinuated, and the conversation about psychosocials really does have to move forward because there's a lot of technology and a lot of processes that would have to be implemented in order to identify them effectively and mitigate them. So we're ahead of the curve in terms of getting the conversation going. Now, there's a long-winded definition from the International Labour Organization for what they are, but at the end of it, hopefully you'll understand some key tenets that define what psychosocials actually are. And you can see it there, the interactions between and among work environment job content, organizational conditions, and a worker's capacities, their needs, culture, personal extra job considerations that may through perceptions and experience influence health, work performance, and job satisfaction. Quite a mouthful. All right, so the point I was making about psychosocial hazards, the conversation is timely. Um, and in the definition of psychosocial work factors, the key points are the psychosocial hazard is derived from the interaction of the worker and the environment. Psychosocial hazards don't exist in the environment independent of the worker, and they are not facilities or aspects of the worker themselves. Also, the perception of the individual about their work environment is a key component of whether or not you're at risk or not. What do I mean by that? It's enough that the employee perceives their environment as stressful or difficult or demanding. Whether it is quantifiably demanding is almost irrelevant. If I perceive my manager to be um, unsupportive, then you are unsupportive to me. 
and my experience of work is going to be influenced by that thought. Yeah? So moving on to what they actually are, and these are some examples. The examples of psychosocial work hazards can be brought into two main categories. Those that relate to the content of your work and those that relate to the context within which you work. <clears throat> the work environment and the equipment you work with is self-explanatory. Obviously, it's frustrating when you have equipment that um, breaks down frequently or a copier that you have to share with several other persons, but it's out of cartridge or the equipment that you have is not appropriate for the tasks that you have to do. Similarly, the workload, the pace at which you work, the schedule of your work matters. So if you are paced by something or someone else external to yourself, the individual may experience that as a little bit more stressful, for want of a better word, than if you were able to make a determination on your own. In terms of the context of work, organizational culture, and within the context of health and safety, safety culture is very important. So within organizations, one of the things that we commonly see, excuse me a second, one of the things that we commonly see is, for example, you will have a factory or a production line where the requirement or the policy is to wear a particular PPE, but you have someone who doesn't or some senior members of the team who do not, and the junior members are now left to wonder, am I supposed to do it? Am I not supposed to do it? So the inconsistencies in operational culture can actually shape one's experience of that and whether you feel like you should or should not. All right. The individual's role within the organization is also an important variable. Um, if you are performing a task that is also done by someone else within the organization, the duplicitousness and or the ambiguity of that actually puts a little bit more strain on the individual because there are likely to be accountability issues in terms of who you report to, um, what the consequence of that job is, and who will actually stand the brunt of the punitive consequences or the remuneration should it be favorable. Career development is also an important work aspect that shapes one's experience of work. There are individuals, for example, who believe that they are working in an environment where there's a glass ceiling. So a lot of my skills are underutilized and I feel like there is little opportunity for career advancement or growth. Those things stifle creativity and actually influence the optimal performance of the employee. And these are not things that are easy to measure. They're not easy to identify, which is part of why they're labeled invisible. It's difficult to see someone who feels underutilized. Yeah? It's not until you're burnt out or you are truly manifesting the signs of distress that someone is likely to look at you and say, well, I think there are consequences here that we need to explore what the cause might be, all right? Decision latitude and control is another variable, and that speaks to how much control you have over the choices related to your work. Again, like pacing, do you make the decisions that are relevant to the outcome of your work? And one of the important, well, not that they're not all important, but one of the key psychosocial work factors is interpersonal relationships at work. It's particularly important because it is one of the few factors that has the ability to mitigate the consequences of poor physical work environment arrangements. What do I mean by that? Individuals who work in an environment where, as with the library team, as um, through our introductory talk and the, the advice that came before my presentation, you would have realized that you guys have an interpersonal dynamic that makes the environment very constructive and you actually feel like you're part of something larger. Enjoying the support of management and your peers is a critical component to reducing the risk from physical work hazards that you're likely to be exposed to. So individuals who work in what could otherwise be considered a horrible work environment in terms of the physicality, tools, the technology, the risk of injury is high, but when management support or peer support is excellent, your risk actually lowers. And that's something that a lot of managers are unaware of and need to tap into. A big part of risk reduction in work environments is not necessarily about the tools and the technology. It's about the way we lead and manage people. The homework interface is also really important because 
the, the balance between what your life outside of work requires of you and what your job requires of you, it's not an easy juggle for a lot of people. Something as simple as starting your work day at eight becomes challenging if you have two children to drop off at school, one at nursery and one at high school, and that needs to be done and you need to negotiate traffic to get to work for eight o'clock. That's taxing. And the individual who their remuneration, compensation, or performance appraisal is tied into punctuality, it becomes an issue if you are unable to meet those targets. Huh? Okay, all right, so I'm coming into the, the cases now. So in case number one, this is an example of missing the psychosocial issues, all right? In this example, I worked in an organization where six of their employees at the same time developed musculoskeletal disorders affecting the upper limb and the back, excuse me. They asked me in to look at physical work environment only. I offered to do a complete assessment, the psychosocials and everything, but they said, no, we wanted to focus on the physicals because that's what they thought was wrong. And that's what their understanding of ergonomics was. When I audited the space, there was very little to correct about the physical environment. Um, this was an office environment and lots of keyboards, lots of monitors, but there really wasn't anything to change. No change in chairs, desks, monitors, anything. However, what jumped out at me were the psychosocials. This is an organization that had recently gone through two mergers in, in relative um, close to each other in time span. The workers were now thrown into a workspace where they were working in new teams and reporting to individuals that they did not previously report to. There was a concern about a redundancy exercise coming and everyone was pretty much just treading water and suffering in silence. The management culture as well was one where, and I saw it for myself, the managers expected the workers to take their lunch at their desks because that's what they did, um, which obviously flies in the Ministry of Labor's guidelines on your lunch hour at work. Um, and the, there was a general sense among the staff that their team leaders were not very sensitive to their needs. However, despite that verbal feedback, all of them reported on the forms that I gave them to appraise their work environment, they all of them rated management support as excellent. And what it meant was you had a group of people who were working with equipment that at face value, it's optimal. The physical space is fantastic, but the conditions under which they work was not surprising that they actually developed musculoskeletal disorders. And the research actually supports it. As long as the psychosocials are off, your risk of injury goes up through the roof. The individuals who are working in environments where the psychosocial variables have not actually been addressed, physical changes are unlikely to be effective. Yeah? All right, so that was case number one. In the second case, this is the opposite end of that spectrum. I went in to look at a liquefied petroleum gas filling plant. It was a family-run operation and the manager asked me, the plant manager asked me to come in and just audit their operations to see if any physical changes needed to be made. When we went through, there were physical changes that needed to be made. Um, it's a petroleum filling station. So the trucks would come in with the empty gas cylinders and the men would offload the 30 pound cylinders manually. So they'd lift them off the truck and throw them down on the loading dock to each other. Um, so there was no hoyer, there was no mechanical lift. You had 30 or 40 men on the floor who were bent over gas cylinders, filling, cleaning, checking, et cetera. On paper, you would look at a dynamic like that and think everybody here must be living with back pain. But the, the obvious prevailing factor was that their psychosocials and leadership management, the culture was so good that these guys had zero injury on their books. When I audited the six month data, there were only two sickness absences and both of those were for respiratory ailments. They weren't for musculoskeletal disorders. So the injury rate was actually almost non-existent in a company that would have been fined by OSHA for every single aspect of their operations. The point of it is that case exemplifies what we're talking about when we say, when you get management right, the risk of injury to your workers goes down significantly. 
the plant manager that walked me through the floor, none of the workers had on ID badges. And he knew every single person by name. He introduced me around to every single individual. The relationship there, manager and workers were on a first name basis. There was a lot of camaraderie and a whole lot of trust and just a basic ease about the work environment and the operational culture. And in that environment, the risk of injury was exceedingly low despite the physicals being off. In the next example that I'd share, it pretty much exemplifies the cost of what happens when you ignore psychosocials in your work environment. This particular individual is a 36 year old female who is a mid-level manager who she's returning to work from a L4 microdiscectomy. That's a resection of a herniated disc at the L4 level in the spine. She is returning to work under the guidance from her surgeon that certain equipment modifications need to be made and I was asked to come in and guide those modifications. Excuse me. When I went in, my time on the floor made it obvious that there were psychosocial issues that were off. And I knew the modifications we were going to do were going to be expensive because they were going to be custom modifications. I told the managers that these modifications, you're unlikely to see the result or the benefit of them if you do not tackle the psychosocials. But they said the remit of the audit was the physical environment, and they asked me to stick to that as well. The bottom line is the individual required $1.5 million worth of customized equipment between the chair that she needed, the desk that she needed, and the supporting infrastructure. However, after the equipment came in, because it had to be shipped in, so she returned to work after it arrived, and within four months, her pains were so severe, she had to leave, and she resigned and left the company with $1.5 million worth of equipment that no one else could use. The bottom line is a lot of her coworkers felt um, that there was a bit of nepotism because she was one of the youngest persons to be promoted to that level. And the other senior managers thought she was being favored or receiving treatment that they would have gotten, but did not. So the perception on the ground and the, the operational culture was one where she was resented and she was on the receiving end of a lack of support and a bit of passive aggressive behavior from the other staff. The absence of that support mitigated against her actually benefiting from the surgery and optimal ergonomic equipment. And it's one of the things that we, we highlight when we talk to our patients in the clinic, in our pain clinic. Pain is mediated by a whole lot more than just your body. So the idea that your pain is coming from the injury in your back or your shoulder or your wrist, and therefore only the interventions geared at that area of your body is going to work, does not actually hold true in clinical practice nor in occupational health. The last case that I wanted to share is that of another female middle manager whom we didn't actually have to touch her to resolve her pain syndrome. This is someone who was living with back pain for about two years. She was being managed by physical therapy. She had gone through two different courses with two different practitioners. Um, she had had an MRI done, which showed she had herniations at, no, it wasn't herniations she had. She had degenerative spinal disease at the fourth to fifth levels of the lumbar spine. And she was referred to the neurosurgeons. The neurosurgeons looked at her and said, we are willing to operate, but after you've seen the physical therapist in our clinic for one last time. So they referred her to physical therapy one more time. When we met her, what jumped out at us was the fact that she was in excellent physical health. We found nothing to treat in terms of an impairment other than her pain. In the conversations about her work environment, she identified the furniture. She thought the boardroom furniture was what was precipitating her pain. She worked um, in an environment where she was a, an executive manager and they had weekly board meetings that she attended. Um, she thought it was a boys club in terms of the organizational structure. And so she was the only female there and the equipment and furniture was designed high tables, um, uncomfortable, broad and large seating. However, when we did her pain journal, we realized that her pain scores started before the meetings not at the meeting. And one of the things that that tells us is that it's not about the furniture that you sit on at the meeting. 
there's something that you are exposed to or you're doing or you are perceiving prior to the meeting. And that conversation led us down the path of the interpersonals. She was a middle manager. She was better qualified than the people she reported to. And she was working in an environment where she thought it was a bit of a glass ceiling, that she was never going to actually move up any higher than she was. She was the only female in the room and was frequently asked to get the water or the coffee when the board team had to break. She resented it and thought it was a little sexist. Her line manager is someone she thought was insensitive and unsupportive. And she believed that he frequently co-opted her ideas and presented them to the board as her own. And based on those issues, we thought there was a lot of organizational injustice. There were a lot of things about career advancement. The, the red flags were all there for psychosocials. And we gave her the information that until you remedy the psychosocials, you are unlikely to see meaningful reduction in your pain. Over the next three to four months, she committed to the coping strategies that we spoke about and tackling the, the problems at the source. Bottom line is, without adjusting the furniture, without us touching her, she was pain-free. She had used mediation to actually negotiate with her manager um, what her beliefs and expectations were and created an environment where she felt actually like she could move forward. The pains went completely. And in fact, she was so profoundly affected by that that she went on to become a motivational speaker because she couldn't believe that the pain she lived with for so long was something that she had the power to address all along. And that was one of the things about psychosocials that has always kept me interested in advancing the conversation about it in work environments. So much of the belief on the ground is that you have to focus on the physicals. And if you are having shoulder pain, it's about something you lifted. If you're having pains in your wrist or your back, it's the way you sit or the way you moved. Your brain really does not distinguish between emotional pain or psychological pain or physical. There's no pain center. It's all largely processed in the same places. And so it's reasonable to expect that when you're going through physical discomfort, your emotional state, your psychological state, and the state of your social environment is likely to influence that experience. And so the takeaway from my presentation really is that if you're going to safeguard the health and safety of every member of your team, wherever you work, it is impossible to divorce your physical health from that of the psychological and social aspects of your work. And psychosocials are not just a fluff. They're not just an additional consideration. I would suggest that they're absolutely critical in any conversation about health and safety. All right? So on that note, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Henry. That was quite, quite a mouthful. I didn't even know that there was a, a bill, let alone it being revised. And, and I definitely didn't know about the um, psychosocial aspect of, of ergonomics. You understand? So I thank you very much for your presentation. And I, and I believe it was really, really awesome. So I'm going to move on to the next, the second speaker now. Thank you again, Mr. Nick, Mr. Henry. You're welcome. Moving on to the second um, speaker, Mr. Ryan Rattry. No, Mr. Rattry, right, was, um, was introduced to us by Ms. Nalda Thompson. Believe me, it's a good thing that we have the Luca workout on the back because I had to run down that lady to catch her, you know. That's how I got a word in. But yeah, I thank you, Miss and Miss Miss Thompson. I thank you very much for allowing us to to use your office in our presentation. Mr. Battery, yours your turn now. Your turn to present, please. Okay, I just wanted to say before Mr. Ratchet comments that as HR, we are thankful for when departments give us an opportunity to, the part, to participate with them in their departmental educational forum, because we see it as a good thing to expand the knowledge of our staff, 
on matters that concern them. I am sure that Ryan will, will, will do an excellent job in informing you of those, those other things. I think it was Mr. Henry who was our first presenter, had you know about the psychosocial part, we'll give you the physical part of it. Thank you again. All right, so this evening, this afternoon, I will be presenting on creating a, an ergonomic work environment. Um, so we'll just jump right into it and discuss what is ergonomics. So as you can see, ergonomics says it's fitting the work to the worker in order to reduce the risk of injury and discomfort. And what, it, what does that mean is that it is the fit between the person who is the worker and, act, and actually what they are doing within the workplace. So this encompass the objects that they may use um, in the environment, the type of processes and procedures that they are engaging, and also how does a good fit is achieved. And this good fit is where the stress on the worker is reduced or eliminated. And this also helps the worker to become comfortable so that they can do their work more efficiently, more productively without discomfort. And so the, the role of a health and safety officer is to ergonomically evaluate specific risk factors in the workplace that may indicate a poor fit between the worker and the environment, and then to make recommendations on how to reduce these, these risks. Um, so what are the disorders that are common to with ergonomic conditions? So here we have um, disorders of the soft tissue, and we're talking about your muscles, your nerves, your tendons, your ligaments, your joints, your cartilage, your blood vessels, and also your spinal disc. So the possible causes of ergonomic conditions are what we we'll refer, um, commonly refer to as musculoskeletal disorders, or awkward posture, force, repetition, vibration, and also contact stress. So what is repetition? So most, of, if not most workers within the library would say, have access to a computer may use a computer throughout the majority of their work day. And so what does repetition entails is you doing the same thing over and over, repeating it for a long period of time. Here is an example of where a worker is using a mouse and where they are crawling the fingers across can increase muscle tension in their forearms and also within their wrists. Um, a common um, condition associated with this is sometimes referred to as carpal tunnel syndrome. It is also associated with repetitive movement using the typewriter or keyboard. So awkward posture. In, on this slide, you can see three different seating scenarios where a person is um, displaying awkward posture. The first one is where they're extending forward to reach the keyboard and the mouse. And by reaching forward, they can cause muscle tension between the shoulder blades, the neck. And especially with this posture, you can have a sustained tension over a period of time. And the second one, we see where the individual is bending forward at the waist during sitting. And I'm sure this is uh, something that many of us are all guilty of who sits at the desk for a long period. And this happens when your feet is not supported and where you put pressure on your lumbar disc. Also, you have the third one is where the shoulder is shrugged upwards. And this happened when the keyboard and the mouse is too tall for the user. So here is where you, um, persons who are ergonomic specialists would say you're not achieving the 90 degree angle between the, the hands and also the desk. Contact stress. So contact stress is where pressure is on the body by a hard, hard edge or surface, and this can reduce circulation and obstruct nerve signal, causing swelling, tingling, or discomfort. 
And here you see the first one where the hardest edge is against the forearm. And also for the second one, you see where the, the front edge of the seat is against the calf. And these, where you see the arrow pointing are, are all the trigger areas where you can have the swelling, tingling, and also discomfort. So recognizing these ergonomic symptoms, the common symptoms are um, associated with musculoskeletal disorders are pain, swelling, tingling, tenderness, and numbness, and sometimes difficulty moving or using the extremities. And it is recommended that if you are experiencing any of these symptoms to visit a physician or a specialist called the occupational um, physician as soon as possible to determine the cause of this pain. And it must be noted that some of these symptoms can also be exaggerated by factors within the individual household, um, such as household chores or um, bedding and furniture could also exaggerate some of these symptoms in addition to causes within the workplace. So what are the ergonomic risk factors? So the main categories of ergonomic risk factors relates to the environment. And within the environment, we are talking risks that are found within the workplace. And some of these risks can be the equipment that they you workers using the tool, the equipment, the office furniture, for instance, chair, desk, and so forth. Um, just as I mentioned a while ago, the equipment, and these are the risks that are associated with the equipment that you're required to use on a day-to-day -day basis while at work. Um, so the, the risks caused by work and equipment processes are procedures. So these are, um, procedures that are you have to undergo within the work environment that can cause increase the risk of developing musculoskeletal disorders. Another risk factor has to do with the individual or worker itself. And these risks are unique to you as an individual, such as the physical conditions, habits, and behavior. And with these risk factors, a major one of them is where you have you have behavior safety um, procedures come into play where you actually um, train the worker on how to sit properly within the physical environment and, and performing the required or appropriate posture. So there are many ways for um, many ways and position that person sit while he's sitting at their desk and bad, pos bad posture, seat in position at the desk. We are all guilty of doing this at one point or another, sometime while at work. So the four areas of focus for it, this is where you doing that um, ergonomics for a computer workstation. And here we see the, the area of focus being four main points, which is the back, are the chair which offer lumbar support. The second one is the feet rest. And the third one is the height of the desk. And the fourth one is where you have the distance of vision between the worker and the computer screen. And the distance between the worker and the computer screen may vary depending on the person if they are, bif if they are wearing bifocal glasses or not. And we'll explain that further down in the presentation. So here we are talking about, here we are looking at the lumbar support or the chair, the height of the back of the chair. The lumbar support here has to do with the cushioning, back support, how high the chair is. And these are all factors that can influence the work of developing um, musculoskeletal disorders. On this side, we are seeing where the armrest can be adjusted for the height. And the ideal position will be the first one where the height of your desk and the keyboard tray, that is if you're using a keyboard tray at your desk, should be aligned. And here we say we achieve the 90 degree angle. The second and third one are a no-no 
in fact, you'll see where the desk, the keyboard tray is too high in the second one. And the third one is where it is, the, the keyboard tray is actually, is actually lower than the armrest of the chair. So here you see where the 90, where the 90 degree um, angle is achieved, where the same, the level of the desk and the keyboard is in alignment with the armrest of the chair. And here, this is what, this is the ideal position for seating. And this will prevent the development of musculoskeletal disorders, in particular, carpal tunnel syndrome. feet of the chair, the feet on your feet on the floor, sorry. So um, the ideal um, condition is that you should have a foot rest or your feet should rest um, solely on the ground. And this is the lesson, the problem that you may experience in your leg and lower back while being seated. The next is the eyes to the screen distance. And this is achieved to reduce, to prevent excessive movement um, or force on the neck. So the, the monitor and the eyes should be in total alignment and should not be positioned where the worker is required to move excessively to see the screen or have their neck in an awkward posture. So these are the these here is showing the trigger points for person who use laptops and actually use it where the 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 height of the screen or the vision is not in alignment. So you're seeing where the head is up and both arms are causing shoulder pain to overreach in order just to reach the laptop. Here you see a person where they have to bend their neck just to look at the screen by looking down. That can cause upper back tension and cause neck pain. And the third one is where the person is now resting and the hands on the table, which is caused by causing trigger points of pain within the wrists, the elbows, the shoulder, the neck. So all these red highlighted sections are trigger points of pain due to awkward posture. So the non-bifocal and the bifocal use of this is where the height of the monitor is adjusted based on the, bi the person having bifocal glasses. So the length, the, for the first one, you see where the monitor is in at eye level or in alignment with the vision of the user. Whereas the second one is where the monitor is slightly lower for persons who wear bifocal glasses. And that prevents only the movement of the eyes rather than the movement of the entire neck and seeing the monitor. So these are common monitor height mistakes for non-bifocal and bifocal users. So the first one you see where the worker is actually too close to the monitor, which is called, uh, <clears throat> can cause significant eye strain over time. As we're for the bifocal user, you will see where he has to hold up his neck, which can cause trigger point for pain the back of the neck here just to see the monitor. So the second one, the monitor is too high as opposed to the first one where the, the user is too close to the screen. So these are sitting postures for the entire computer workstation. And the first one is the wrong sitting back posture, um, sitting posture, which show you all the trigger points for pain that you may experience by sitting in such a position over a long, work period. And by what we mean work period is recommended is an eight hour work period throughout the work day, as opposed to the second one, which is the correct seat sitting posture. So common ergonomic problems are the blackberry thumb, which is, um, is most commonly associated with persons who use um, touchscreen phones and tablets. You have carpal tunnel syndrome, we have osteoarthritis, we have tendonitis, we have tension in the neck and shoulders, we have trigger finger, and these are common ergonomic problems are musculoskeletal disorders. 
So what are the solutions for ergonomic? And the first one is to help, which is to help to minimize and possibly eliminate risk factors in the workplace. And the first one is the procurement of ergonomically friendly tools, equipment, and furniture. Um, the second one is to always talk to your supervisor about what to do if you're experiencing pain within the soft tissue that you suspect is related to using the tool or equipment or furniture in the workplace. The next one is to talk to a health and safety officer to identify what is causing your pain and also to find solution. Other common solutions can be reducing the pace of work, alternating between repetitive tasks with non-repetitive tasks at regular intervals, increasing the number of breaks that you take between repetitive work. Also, the one is to maintain good posture while sitting, standing, also to maintain correct posture to stretch stretch or what you call to lumber up your muscles before and after work and also taking regular breaks outside of work you can exercise regularly you can ensure that your workplace your workstation is set up ergonomically correct for you um, ensuring that lighting within your work area is is adequate and also reporting ergonomic hazards and symptoms to your supervisor so the UMONA HRM, the Occupational Health and Safety Unit, you can contact us at these contact information. We have our email for the HRM, the customer service email address. Also my personal address, my email address for my assistant, Kadian Morris, and also our extension that you may contact us to report any health and safety related issue in the workplace on the campus. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Vatry. Well, I'm learning. It's as if I'm in a classroom. So first I learn about the legal aspect and the psychosocial aspect. Now I'm finding out that the monitors need to be at different level for bifo for for bifocal and non-bifocal um, users. This is just a wealth of information. So I thank you again, Mr. Ratri, for your presentation. And I'm going to open the floor for any questions. I'll check in with my team members. Mrs. Yufar, Mr. McCoy, is there any question in the chat? I'm not seeing any as yet, not a, Ms. Not Johnson. As yet. Okay. So that being said, I have a question, right? Mike, I'll, I'll just throw the first question. I read somewhere that noise can be an ergonomic risk. Is that true? Any one of the speaker, Mr. Vatry or Mr. Henry, you can go ahead and answer. I just want to know, is it? It can be. Um, noise falls under the physical ambient environment in terms of sound quality. So arguably it falls under industrial hygiene. So you're looking at lighting, ventilation, um, the humidity as well as the airflow within the space and noise. The interesting about um, the sounds within your environment, noise represents the interpretation that it is negative. Meaning, for example, in an open floor office plan um, where I am on the phone in my cubicle and I'm interviewing someone, but I can overhear the conversation happening next door. If that conversation is in my opinion, inappropriate or distracting, it becomes noise to me. But if it isn't, it's not noise. If you understand what I'm saying, there's a subjective quality to noise um, in terms of it, it is the negative end of the, the subjective uh, assessment of sound. Um, so by the time it is labeled noise, the, the connotation is that it is a nuisance 
and from certainly within the physical environment um, and the analysis of the, the environment, uh, either through industrial hygiene or ergonomics, it is something that would be considered a possible deterrent for your performance. Because if you are distracted by the sound, your attention is taken from the task in front of you. And so your performance can deteriorate. So I'm not sure if that adequately answers your question, Nicole, but uh, my short answer would be yes, it, it can be. Adequate. It definitely does. It definitely does. Uh... But um, then you can also look at noise from the aspect of with the level of sound that is that will physically um, cause you harm. So for ex exist, uh, for example, the the standard or the recommended um, decibel by NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Health for Safety and Health in the U.S., recommend a 85 decibel for an eight hour eight hour workday. So for for that the Standard is saying that if the if the level of sound exceed that standard, then it's you it is considered a hazard or close to the stand or close to eighty five decibel. So you can also look at it from that standpoint. Okay, that is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see Doctor Carr with her hands up. Doctor Carr, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Um, I'm a little, um, I'm trying to find the right word because I heard so much today that could possibly impact our staff in the library. And I wanted to start on that last note um, from Mr. Henry. But it, it is a good segue into what Mr. Ratri spoke about because he said you cannot divorce the psychosocial from the physical. The challenge, the challenge for me, and it's maybe not a challenge, is how do we always get that balance? How do we always find the because if I have a start in, in another life at another institution um, and this is years and years and years and years ago um, there was a staff member who had a, what we thought was a physical well the person said it was physical and it went on for a very long time and it was within in the government service. And you know, the government service has something called um, a medical boarding. And when they decided to medical board this person, all of a sudden the person became well. Um, well, I don't know if the person became well, but the person could respond to their work. And I'm just wondering, so it clearly, it clearly was maybe a psychosocial um, and really may not have been physical, uh, Mr. Henry. I'm trying to find out how do we identify when the difference um, is, the difference between both, between the psychosocial and the physical, because we do not always have access to um, like your expertise. Sometimes when people um, talk about their, their situations, um, we don't always get the full picture. How do we as the administrators, the people who really want to get the best for our staff, how do we identify? Do we always need to call in a specialist like you? I know we can call in HR and HR is very focused on, and I'm not saying they don't do the, the psychosocial because they would um, sometimes refer persons to like the health center, the counseling unit and so to deal with those aspects. But I'm just trying to find out how do we ensure that we are always addressing the the right aspect 
to help the staff member. And any Mr. Mr. Ratchet could answer, Mr. Henry. Yeah, I am. I'm somewhat concerned. Anyone? I will let Mr. Ratchet take it in terms of. I can speak um, from what would obtain in best practice and elsewhere in the world. But um, if your question is specific to the library service. Um, I will let Mr. Ratri take it in terms of what obtains in terms of your procedures locally. I think that answer might be more sensitive to what you need, um, but I can always explain um, following on Mr. Ratri what um, obtains elsewhere in the world. Okay. Um, um, right, so in terms of uh, psychosocial issues within the workspace, and particularly the library, the issue is that once that once that has been determined that is a psychosocial issue, it's normally referred to Dr. Debbie Chambers at the health center. She's the head for the university counseling unit. And I think she's a psychologist. So she's a person who does these evaluation for us and determines the next step going forward. And it's a matter of psychosocial. There's also the element of confidentiality as into who has access to the information as it relates to the staff member. So that's a second component to it. But in terms of medical evaluation and um, psychological evaluation, that will be done by Dr. Debbie Chambers at the University Counseling Unit. If I can add to that, um, one of the things that needs to obtain um, in work environments, whether, whether it's industry, office, etc you need a systematic screening process where you are creating a compendium or a database of the documented psychosocial work factors. Um, one of the things that um, hopefully I conveyed from my presentation was that you can't divorce the psychosocial analysis from the interpretation of the individual. And so there's a level at which if you want to screen for psychosocials being present in your workspace, you would need to canvas your entire whole employee base at some point. Um, and preferably that's something that's ongoing. I mean, whether you do it annually or semi-annually at intake for new staff during changes in organizational structure, or if you've relocated the library to another physical building or you've changed the process, you really should canvas the staff to see what the impact is, both in terms of the physical assessment of what has changed and an interpretative um, look at the employee's experience of what has changed. Um, there are, and it's in my presentation, um, and I will email it to you guys um, if you didn't actually see it, but there's quite a lot of links on um, what to do in terms of international best practice, let me put it this way, is that you are, no conversation about musculoskeletal disorder happens without discussing psychosocials. Um, the, the evidence and the research is suggesting that your risk is probably going to be at the very least 50-50. There's lots of people who are having aches and pains that are unrelated to the physical. So it's not linear. So you, you can end up wasting a lot of money if you're shelling out equipment expenses without looking at psychosocials. So internationally, the conversation is about what do we do? The very same question you're asking, and it's been asked and answered elsewhere. So there's a lot of um, toolkits and templates out of Australia, out of Canada and the UK that look at how to canvas the instruments that you can use at an individual level and the instruments that you can use like the HSE screening tool out of the UK. Um, that's something that's just two pages and it's electronic. If you wanted to keep it digital, you can canvas your employees and just to get a sense of the temperature on the ground, who is having an issue, in broad categories, management support, um, role ambiguity, job demands, et cetera. And the individuals who certainly red flag, it's wonderful that the university has the opportunity to refer to a trained psychologist in occupational health, um, but not everyone is going to require psychological counseling. Some of it comes back to um, the management and the leadership styles. So, because one of the, one of the problems with people who experience pressures at work, frequently in the existing model, the blame is played out, placed on the worker. The individual is led to believe that you are 
and you're either faking it or your problem is in your head or you're just not managing your stress properly. But what the, the developed world has realized that there's no point in looking at it like that. If the worker is distressed in the work environment, let's figure out what we can change to make that more comfortable. Um, there's really no point in blaming because you're never truly going to prove, um, which is my answer to you as well. The, you're never really going to be able to draw a hard line between what is personal to you and what is the work because the two things, your, your mind, your brain, your, your feelings are at work, whether you're at work or at home. So it's going to be difficult. You're never going to really be able to prove that it's work that's causing the distress and not home. What the employer's obligation though is to do is to identify what, if any psychosocial hazards exist in your work system and make the best effort you can to eliminate them. And that's, that's really your obligation in law now, which, which is part of the problem because we don't have, when I say we, I mean broadly across work and industry in Jamaica, there are not a lot of companies that have policies regarding psychosocial hazards, um, have operational procedures for screening, have referral processes. That really, that infrastructure doesn't currently exist pervasively. And that's where the problem is going to arise. Um, but the conversation has moved past elsewhere in the world I'm trying to figure out how much of this is work and how much of it is personal, how much of it is physical versus how much of it is psychological. In the interest of moving the worker forward, that conversation, it doesn't make any difference. You really just have to do what the best you can do to eliminate all of your hazards, physical and psychosocial. Thank you so much. It's, it, it seems, oh. It seems much harder because the psychosocial is not as easy. Um, you know, you can, and because you say you cannot, they're not, it's not linear. You can't say, okay, I'm going to just look at one or the other, but it's much harder to get at the psychosocial um, factors. Um, because in Jamaica too, we're not very open to talking about um, what may be bothering me, um, whether it's a, it's a emotional issue, uh, um, you know, interpersonal maybe affecting me, um, a mental. We, we're not we're not very open where. It's easier for somebody to say that, um, you know, I need a new chair than to say, um, and it's easier to, to, to address the, the physical because the psychosocial, as you, I mean, I was like jotting down a number of things um, that you talked about with the psychosocial, especially when you mentioned when you had and 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 let me say thanks those case studies were like excellent they were like i mean just they just drove home the what was happening on the ground but when you talked about that passive aggressive behavior in one instance with us with one of this the staff members because of what she was feeling um and then the more the, the, the thing that grabbed me and I'm still challenged by also is a matter of the interpretive aspect of that um, psychosocial so that I interpret that somebody um, doesn't like me and is treating me badly. That's my interpretation of it. Um, how, how do we, it, it just seems like it is, it, 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 do we really address these matters um, practically and robustly in, in, in organizations, especially psychosocial? The, the short answer is yes. There, there are companies who have very good systems in place. Most of the companies who get it right are multinational meaning they are held to a higher standard because the parent company exists in a context where legally this is something they're used to. Um, there are things like um, something very, very simple would be like tolerance within Jamaica for 
persons who have um, different religious beliefs or different sexual orientations, these are things that we still battle with in terms of how to honestly integrate these individuals into a work environment without um, compromising, I guess, our personal or organizational or, or national cultures. Um, but the short answer to your question is you can get it right. There's the opportunity for mediation, but it's, I think mediation is what most local companies do more of. So when the individual perceives that my line manager is unfair to me. So regardless of how you interface with other persons, my experience of interacting with you seems prejudicial. That's a valid opinion. Um, and what you do not want to do is to say to the employee, either literally or philosophically, to communicate to them that their view is not valid. What you want to do is explore what is it in the, the, the line manager's behavior or previous interaction that would have led to that conclusion. Because the fact of the matter is, on a larger model, if I experience you that way, there is the entire possibility that someone else will as well, either now or in the future. So you do want to tackle it. You do not want to sit in silence, you know, which I think the confusion locally is we are not yet at the point where we have the systems and the fidelity to truly dovetail management down to the individual. So there's a level, for example, one of the challenges I've often found is when employees have an issue with their supervisor and the problem is the supervisor and style, your leadership style does not lend itself well to the operational culture within the space that you're working with. So the people you're leading are not the appropriate herd for your leadership style. So it leads more to conflict than anything else. And so in those contexts, usually the balance of power resides with the supervisor. So it's not often that a supervisor is gonna be pulled off the line and taken back to leadership orientation or training. It's usually the worker who is told, tough it out or deal with it. Nobody else has a problem. And that approach is not taken in other jurisdictions. We validate the individual, um, not to say that you're gonna cave in and change, but the culture of the workspace has to be, we want to figure out what we're getting wrong. So in what ways are we making our employees either collectively or individually uncomfortable? And unhappy employees pulling down a salary for suboptimal work is it's really how it is. So it's going to affect either the quality of what you're producing or the quantity. It may not be obvious to you, but it's likely to affect and the longevity of that worker. So. Um, it makes dollars and cents to pay attention to how you lead people and their experience of working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. I must say, I, I love the way you answer the questions. You go in depth for us to understand and then you come back and give us the short answer as you would put it. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Vatry. Oh, Thank you for your input. Our chair, the chair for LUCO, our it's Health and Wellness Committee. The chair for our Health and Wellness Committee has his hands up. However, I'm going to, there's a question in the chat that is, I believe is, is in line with this, with what you're talking about now. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. So Ms. Arison, to Mr. Henry, can you please speak to the cost of assessing a workplace? To the short answer is it's billed according to what you're asking for. Um, it's, it's the amount of time that goes into it that I bill for. Um, so I charge 75 US an hour for my time. Um, so it depends on what you're asking for. If it's an individual assessment, of a one workstation versus um, a, a unit or a department, um, it, it would vary on the amount of time it would take to get that done. Um, and I am sensitive to the efficiencies that the company can provide. So if there is um, paperwork that needs to be circulated, the reporting that comes afterwards, if you want to undertake the cost of the um, paperwork and dissemination, I would reduce the cost for that. Um, but most of my work now, I've dialed a lot of my consultation work, largely because when I, when I came back from my studies in the UK, 
one of the things that I found was, and let me just say this, ergonomics is a, is a profession. It's a discipline unto itself elsewhere in the world. In Jamaica, it's kind of like the orphan child. It resides, it doesn't have a home. So ergonomics is taught to physical therapists as a part of their program. It's taught to engineers at UTEC in the Faculty of the Built Environment. It's taught to dentists. It's taught as a module within occupational health and safety. But it's a profession and a discipline in its own right. Health, you know, you can train to the PhD level with subspecialty in the UK, Canada, the United States, um, and most of the developed world. And it's not a coincidence that having that level of training available um, happens in countries that do well economically. Because the truth is, ergonomics is applicable in all aspects of human pursuit, in recreation, in sports, in industry. Um, there's just so much application for it. So when I came back from the UK, completely overwhelmed with that information because I didn't know anything about that. And when I came back, what I found was there was a, a resistance in industry to soak up the conversation that ergonomics can do a whole lot more than look at your desks and chairs and your, your keyboards. Um, but I don't think the landscape was ready to hear that. So a lot of my time was spent educating and teaching um, and now I think my contributions to the OCK Health program um, would have empowered, I think, a few more people to have a broader approach to what ergonomics can do for you. So I usually prefer to let the in-house um, experts handle. And if you need an opinion or guidance, I'm willing to do that. But most of my practice now is dedicated in the clinical setting. So we, I'll take the injured worker back from injury back into the workspace. That, that's what I tend to focus on. But to dovetail back to your answer, um, I charge 75 US an hour, and that is um, dependent on what you require. An individual assessment would probably run an individual about 14 to 15,000 of it done. Um, but a company, there'd be, there'd be modifications to how that is priced. Thank you, Mr. Henry. I hope that answers Ms. Harrison's question. I will a question move. for Mr. Ratri. Mr. Ratri. Yeah, it is saying that I am guilty of bad posture for persons. Where can I um, source this type of chairs from Ms. Nicholas? Um, the what I recommend is that before you even source a chair, it is best to do an evaluation in the current chair that you're in. So I, if you have an issue, I can, I can come and do the evaluation for you. But I want to evaluate in the current chair that you're in to recommend what chair would you um, be needing going forward. So before you go ahead and procure the chair, I can do the assessment, the evaluation, and make a recommendation for you. Thanks so much, Mr. Ratri. Um, I didn't know that that was offered by the university. I did not know. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that did not know. I'm going to, the link for, for your link website is placed in the chat and I'm going to open the mic now for Lucas Chair to ask his question or make his comment. Mr. Aaron, you can go ahead. Uh, thanks so much, um, Ms. Johnston. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to go back to where we started. Um, so, Mr. Henry, so it's similar to the players to football. The players win the game and the coach cause us to lose. Right? I want, uh, because <clears throat> the case study that you use with the cylinder, and you are thinking that back pain will come from the work that they are doing. But you found in the study that the, the psychosocial aspect of it was really high. And I would like to just put in um, perspective now, let's say for argument's sake, we are working in an environment where we don't have good chairs, where we don't have air conditioning unit. And so because of that, the the organization or the worker 
the worker becomes aggravated a bit, you know, and, and, and then as you say, the, 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 the leaders now would want to say, oh, my AC is not working as well, so just deal with it. Help us, help us as leaders um, by making some recommendations or suggestions on how would we deal with the psychosocial aspect of ergonomics. And um, to Mr. Ratchway, I, I see that this is why the university has, has in place um, best practices by providing safety gear, safety gears um, for, for its employees, right? With such an important um, aspect, is there any policy that deals with persons not wearing or participate or yeah, persons not wearing their protective gears? Is there anything in the university policy that, that deals with that? Because I think this is an important um, thing that we need to look at. Thanks. So I'll start off. Um, the, it comes back to systems, Mr. Heron. I think for you to be able to, you can't improve what you don't measure. So there's a level of which you can't tackle psychosocials in any environment if you're not benchmarking. You have to know what is the problem on the ground. In the scenario that you're creating um, with the air conditioning unit and other aspects of the physical environment being off, the question is, where is the facility's maintenance responsibility in that dynamic? Your equipment needs to be checked. They need to be serviced. Because the truth is, if you have a system where um, equipment breaks down regularly, the solution to optimizing that system is not to ask the worker to tough it out. It is to remediate your maintenance processes. You need to make sure that when there is a problem, you identify it early um, and that you have regular maintenance on systems so that you are not breaking down and having to adjust. So you do preventive maintenance. It's this is one of the, the, the shortcomings I find in a lot of industry. So we spend hard capital to equip, but there, isn't, there really isn't the supporting systems to make sure that there's a budget and there are technologies and, and support systems to make sure that we're maintaining what we have. So we, we fork out a lot of the capital for the expensive BITU unit, um, for the air conditioning, and then what you end up with, it breaks down and we don't have the money or the service tech lives in Colorado and we have to wait until next year when he comes. It's those little things. It's really for you to have a system that runs smoothly and to take off a lot of the psychosocials, it really just happens um, when you have effective systems in place um, and you definitely have to benchmark. If you don't know what the issues are currently, it's difficult to tackle an individual in the future because you do not know what the complaint is from that individual in terms of my physical environment, if that is echoed throughout his unit, throughout his um, office, throughout the region, you really don't know. So it's difficult to scale your response in the absence of benchmarking. So to, to, I mean, the, the guidance and information, I will email it to you guys, um, but there is a plethora of literature of how to systemically attack um, these problems, because we're not the only ones. These problems come up elsewhere and have been tackled and answered before. But the short answer is you have to have systems, continuous systems that are tackling the big problem from the top down. Because what you absolutely want to avoid is where you're leaving the worker feeling like they're the ones that have to deal with the problem. So if the air conditioning breaks down, that's not the worker's responsibility to fix it. But you know, if you're going to ask me to tolerate the heat, my question will be for how long, you know? Um, and so that's not something that the worker can fix. And we, we need to divorce the two and put the responsibility squarely where it, where it resides. So short answer benchmark. So you know what the issues are and start tackling from there. And two, but make sure your supportive maintenance systems and your, your pathways for what to do with the individual and what to do collectively you have clear procedures and possible policies to dictate that. You know? that's, that's where most people would have to start. 
if you don't already have those things in place. Right, so the, the current um, occupational health and safety policy for the campus, it is currently doing the rounds. It is set to be approved by F and GPC um, sometime this year, um, within the next few months. So in that policy, it states about um, the university is required to provide um, this safety gear for all employees and also provide safety um, gears for students in some regards where it is required. In terms of staff not using their safety gear it, in the policy, it states that the current um, disciplinary procedures that is currently on campus in terms of the disciplinary policy, it will the that will tie in to that current current policy. And so in terms of disciplinary procedures, um, where you have grievance and grievance procedures as well, that's where the disciplinary action will be taken. So it the current procedure where you have the department taking action at that level where it is not remediated there, it is move along to the campus disciplinary hearings. So it is within that framework that this will be factored into. But once the policy is, once the policy is signed off by F and GPC, then we'll have a much clearer picture and that will be communicated to the campus community. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Vatre. We're, we're, um, we're exceeding our time that we had set. However, I have one last question. It's a, it's a kind of scenario. So I have a, I have a backache, right? And I've done everything except to get a, um, a surgery. This question is directed at Mr. Henry. And I've done everything except um, doing a surgery. I was referred to the physiotherapy department, but by sitting here in this webinar and garnering all this knowledge, how oh, can I say to the phys physical therapist that I would like to get a psychosocial assessment done? It's, well, usually it's not up to the patient to initiate the conversation. It's typical for the physical therapist to um, bring that to the fore. Uh, meaning it's one of the things that there are certain clinical signs that we look for to say that it is possible that your, your aches and pains and your symptoms are not just bound in your, your physical body anymore. Meaning, um, if I'm to elaborate a little bit more, in especially there's a whole lot of research about neck and back pain um, of the musculoskeletal disorders, right? So what I was saying was the, the neck and back pain has been studied extensively and there are two of the conditions that we know. Um, what you see on imaging, for example, on the MRIs, there are lots of people walking around with horrible MRIs. I myself have a herniated disc at two levels, but I'm pain-free. Frequently, what a lot of patients you know, end up doing is they get imaging, um, it looks bad, um, and the belief is this is what's causing your pain. And it feeds the idea that there is a physical treatment that needs to happen. Um, and we tend to um, focus purely on the physical, the exercise therapy, the modalities, the painkillers. But there comes a point where there is a time window where we expect your pain, when it's driven purely by the physical, there is a point beyond which it really should start to settle if it is bound in the physical. If there are other variables, psychologically or socially, that may be contributing, um, then that would have to, that conversation would come up after an appropriate period of time. Um, but to come back to your question, I would have thought your physical therapist would have initiated that conversation already. If they haven't, then you can broach the subject um, because there are instruments that they can ask you to fill in that would allow them to assess the variables that are relevant to you because it really isn't one size fits all. They really would have to contextualize what you do and the elements around your work in order to come up with an action plan for you. Um, but in summary, I mean, just broach the subject with your physical therapist, whoever is managing you, just let them know that there are other variables that you think might be contributing to your, your experience of your pain and would like to have that conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. Thank you very much. I am going to move on to the next item on our agenda now. I'm going to invite Mr. Brown, David Brown, 
to give the vote of thanks. Mr. Ratri, Mr. Henry, this was, <laughs> this was, <laughs> this was breathtaking. Thank you very much. Mr. Brown, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, let me use this opportunity to say how personally happy I am to be a part of this webinar, to be listening in. And um, the information is, is, is it, it drives home um, some of the thinking that I've, I've had based on experience over time uh, working here at the UA and, and my association. Um, and what it does is, is sort of brings into focus and put in greater context um, this, this issue of um, psychosocial um, issues at the workplace and uh, as opposed to the physical workspace. And I think personally that this information is helpful in that there are baby steps that we can make. I think Mr. Ratri's presentation outlines um, a lot of the baby steps that we can take in terms of our posture, in terms of you know, the physical environment, or we actually use the furniture and the equipment around us, um, especially given you know, the, 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 the financial constraints. And certainly, Mr. Henry um, gave us some, some really good pointers as to the psychosocial issues. So sometimes when I'm in the workplace, it's probably people probably can refer to me less as a madman and probably suggest that I have some psychosocial issues going, that, going on with me. So I think it's really good, it's really informative. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm here is hoping that the, the library um, can continue to work along with HR to, especially in this virtual environment that we now live in, to probably share some of these little um, tidbits of, of, of psychosocial issues and safety issues in general, health and safety issues that that can help us. So not to take long on behalf of the Mona Library, um, Library Health and Wellness Committee, I just want to take this opportunity, gentlemen, to thank you. Thank you a whole lot for your time, for your expertise, and for sharing with us and for enlightening us on the issues of health and safety in the workplace. Thanks a lot. You guys are welcome, man. Anytime. Thank you very thank much, you, Mr. Byrne. Thank, thank you for having me. <laughs> this was really, really good. I want to thank our presenters, Mr. Henry and Mr. Ratri, and also all the participants for attend this, attending this webinar and making it a success. I've learned things that I didn't know anything about. You understand and i'm very thankful for that i'm thankful for your presentation i will as soon as i get copies of your presentation i will share it with the staff compliment thank you again you're welcome Nicole. mr chair you have any closing remarks Um, well, thank you very much. You have said it and you have done well. Um, definitely, definitely have learned a lot here today. And I, I was just, just going to say that when you have a presentation and there's no question, uh, one of two things um, will, will occur. Either you do a very good job and you have left the audience wow, you know, or you have um, you have, you, you have not presented the information adequately, so everyone is lost. But here today, I am pleased to know and to say that you, know, you have done well. And the information here is very rich, very rich. And um, the health and wellness team, Luca, will definitely be looking at how we can now introduce ergonomics, especially the, the psycho um, social aspect of it, um, how we can make sure that we improve the, the staff complement and so that everyone can work um, well, even when we're lifting up the cylinder um, and we will complain about our backs because um, as you said, um, the boss knows my name and cares. So thank you very much and well done, um, Luca, and well done to you, Nicole, um, and to the presenters. Well done, awesome job. Awesome job.
I'm sure we could stay here the entire day asking questions. <laughs> I could. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you very much. And bye. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. Same to you. Thanks.